acknowledge that the offices of eCampus Ontario are located in downtown Toronto and are within the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. I'm joining this session today from Sudbury, which is on the traditional land of the Anishabe, the people of Turtle Island, and the Atikamasheng, and the Anishabwebek. And I would also like to recognize the Wanapate First Nation and the Métis Nations of Ontario. Sarah has shared a land acknowledgement and some links in the chat, and please feel free to take the opportunity to share your own as well. I'd like to pass the presentation over now to our facilitator for this session, Niall Williams, uh, and he will share his slide deck. Thank you, Laura. Appreciate it. Let me just bring up my screen. Share my sound. All right. And I think I should be good. Let me go full screen. Are we good, Laura? Yep. Beautiful. Thank you very much. So hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon. As mentioned, my name is Lyle Williams, and I'm an adaptive technology specialist. I'll describe myself. I'm a middle-aged individual with black hair and a black beard. I'm wearing a black zip-up jacket and a blue t-shirt. I'm also wearing bilateral hearing aids because I have a hearing-based disability. And normally I would apologize if I ask you to repeat any questions that I miss here, but I was encouraged last week to not apologize for this. So I might not apologize. I'm gonna try, I'm working on it. I'll try my best. Um, I appreciate your attention to this ever important issue for our learners that supports our learners at our post-secondary institutions. And I wanna thank eCampus Ontario for hosting this session among many other session, sessions that they're doing that provide the support to help us grow as educators. And I also wanna thank the, the team that is providing accessibility through CART services today as well. You'll notice that the title of this session talks about unlocking accessibility. And I, I did that intentionally with the idea that many times, sometimes we forget and it becomes an afterthought. And we go through a process of having to remediate content or fix it, address these accessibility issues. So with today's session, I'm hopeful that you become champions champions for unlocking your content that you create and that your teams create and that address accessibility issues and particularly from a caption, transcript and description or descriptive point of view. Now I recognize that we are all at different places in our accessibility knowledge and on this learning journey with accessibility. So I'm hopeful that this webinar will provide information to people at different points throughout their journey. Um, so let's, let's begin by getting a sense of who is in the room here today. Um, if you came to my session last week, I did this similar thing where I wanna get a sense of where you are with your captioning knowledge. In other words, if you're a level one and you don't really know the difference between a caption and to capture, then you might want to indicate a one in the chat. Whereas if you're a two, you know, you're good friends with captions. You have a good working relationship. You have a good sense of how they work. And then if you're a three, you are a captioning machine. You know everything there is about captions and you can teach me a thing or two. So if you can put a one, a two, or a three into the chat, I'd appreciate it. So lots of two is good. Two, three, ooh, I see that Harper. Uh, very good, twos. Okay. And the thing about captions is that, yes, we've been using these things. A lot of us are familiar with them. So your, your baseline knowledge should be reasonable, um, but I recognize that not everyone has lots of exposure to them. So we'll try to cover the breadth of captions today. Thank you for doing that. Um, I have a quote on the slide, and I like to include a quote when I do my presentations. And this quote says, courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes, Courage is that quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I'll try again tomorrow. 
And so for some of you, this might be a goal. And the goal is that you're heading towards more and more accessible content that incorporates captions, that addresses transcripts, that includes described video. Whereas for others, you know, you've taken these steps and you, you're pretty good about incorporating some of these elements, if not all. But it's this, this, it, this ultimate progress towards improving, you know, this Kaizen principle, if you ever heard of that, towards better and better accessible content for our learners. And so that's, that's sort of our goal. That's our, that's our mission here today. I've always loved cartoons as a child. I would sit in front of the TV and I would have my bucket of Lego and I'd build my Lego as I'm watching cartoons. In the past time, I enjoyed it. And since I have you captive for somewhat of an hour, about an hour, I thought we might want to watch an animated show together. So let's do that. Let's watch this 90 second clip of an animated show. From the creators of Tangled and Wreck-It Ralph, Disney. A carrot-nosed coal-eyed snowman shuffles up to a purple flower peeping out of deep snow. Ooh. Hello. <laughs> he takes a deep sniff. <sighs> <laughs> His nose lands on a frozen pond. A reindeer looks up and pants like a dog. <gasps> Seeing the reindeer slip on the ice, the snowman smiles and moves towards him, though actually he's running on the spot. The reindeer falls on his chin. The snowman uses his arm as a crutch. The reindeer paddles his front legs. Head over heels, the snowman crawls along the ice. The reindeer does the breaststroke. The snowman rolls his body but flips onto his back. The reindeer's tongue sticks to the ice. The snowman hurls his head, twig arm and reindeer lips, tug at the carrot. The carrot flies off and lands in soft snow. The reindeer goes after it with snowman and his body parts hanging on his tail. The snowman puts himself back together again and glumly contemplates his noseless state. The reindeer jams the carrot back in place and pants like a proud puppy. The snowman pats him with his stick thin arm, then goes to sneeze. He grabs his nose with both hands. His head shoots off. Frozen, coming this winter in 3D. So I hope the sound came through and I hope you could see those captions as well along the bottom. And so thank you for indulging me with that video. Let me see if I can get back to full screen here. Okay. Um, thank you for indulging me with that. And you can see my setup there, right? Uh, that video incorporates the elements we're meant to discuss today. It addresses three key components in creating accessible video and audio. And we're gonna highlight a particular tool that's incredibly power to, powerful in ensuring that your content is accessible. Captions are more than just text on a screen. They're a bridge. They're a bridge to understanding, to engagement, to inclusion for millions of users around the world. You can see in this image of Merrill Evans, a professional speaker and advocate, you can see that there's a demonstration here of poor captions because we have text overlaying text. We want to ensure that when we're developing content, we're addressing issues like this because captions play a pivotal role in digital accessibility, ensuring that videos, webinars, and other multimedia are accessible to those who are deaf, deafened, or hard of hearing. And beyond that core audience, captions benefit a wide range of users, including our non-native language speaking students, as an example, who may be English language learners or individuals in sound sensitive environments. Some of us might have TVs in our offices that are playing CP24 or whatever news is, is on the screen and the captions are displayed. And for learners who benefit from visual reinforcement of spoken content. 
Some people might have cognition or comprehension challenges and having that text accompanying the video is helpful. By providing these text-based alternatives to audio, we enhance people's comprehension. We address issues with retention and we increase the engagement of our content. A quick history of captioning is that it was developed in the early 1970s for broadcast television. Captions were designed to make media accessible for those who are deaf or hard of hearing. And the advent of closed captioning technology allowed viewers to toggle captions on or off, making a huge leap forward in accessibility. And then over these years, we've seen many legal mandates here in Canada and in the US push and solidify the importance of captions in ensuring equal access to information and entertainment. And so we want to get to the why, right? We're kind of painting this picture of why it's so important to ensure that our content is accessible. And that's because we want to include everyone. We don't want to exclude any user, any learner, any person from our content. We want to ensure that those who may have cognitive or processing challenges can understand the content. We want to make sure that users who have fine motor or gross motor challenges can navigate our content. People who are blind or low vision can rely on described video in our content. And then those who are deaf, deafened, or hard of hearing and who require captions can access this content. And it supports these categories of users, but as we've discussed, it supports so many other users from a universal design perspective. Now, there are different types of captions, so bear with me if you don't mind. And I want to spend some time looking at these different cases. So we may have all heard of closed captions, or we see that CC logo on content. And you know it's closed caption when you're watching TV and you see that logo or that symbol or you're watching a video and you see that logo or that symbol that you have the option of enabling it or clicking on it to see those captions. But did you know that closed captions implies that capacity to turn it on or to turn it off? So anytime you can see a toggle where you can enable a caption or disable it, that's a closed caption. Alternatively, we have open captions. And open captions are not as common. You're not going to see these too much in the wild, but they're there. And what open captions are, are captions where it's burned into the video or it's embedded directly into that video stream, meaning you can't remove them. You can't turn them off. They're encoded as part of that video. And then the third type of captions are subtitles. And you're probably familiar with subtitles if you've ever watched a foreign language film, <clears throat> excuse me, or you require another captioning language. That is an example of a subtitle where you can switch from a caption of the spoken language to an alternative language. So to summarize, we have three types of captions. We have closed captions, which allows you to turn them on and turn them off. We have open captions where they're burned right into the video. And then we have subtitles, which support changing languages and also being able to turn them on and off. So let's see an example of each of these. So this first video, I'm gonna play it, but I think it's gonna make some sound. Let me see if I can mute it as soon as I start. Ever pondered the weight of knowledge. Okay, so you can see the videos play, right? And there's that CC logo or CC icon in the bottom down here. I can click on that button and it gives me the option to turn on English Canadian captions. And when I do so, up they pop. And what's neat about this video player is it gives you some flexibility. So if I don't want my captions at the bottom there, I can move them over here to the side if they're blocking something, right? I have some flexibility with that. I can also go into the settings and the caption settings. And you can see I have things like I can adjust the size. I can adjust the color. If I don't want the background transparency on, I can turn it off, right? And now it loses that black box there. And so 
good players give users this level of flexibility to go in and make adjustments to the captions that suit their needs best. So this is an example of a closed caption because I can turn it on and I can turn it off. OK, now let's look at an open caption. OK, so now the open caption is playing. And so you can see, I didn't press anything. It just started rolling. It's in that video. And if I come over here to the CC logo, you can see the captions aren't even added. So there's no caption enabled as part of this player, but the video itself, oops, sorry, let me go back. The video itself has the captions baked in or burned into the video, right? There's no ability to move these around. I can't do anything with them. They're just sort of stuck in this video. The third kind of caption is a subtitle. So if I play this video, ever pondered the weight of knowledge and I mute it, you'll see right down here in the bottom, we have our captions button. So I can turn on my captions and they should start to display. There they are. And if I go into the gear or the settings and I go to subtitles, you'll see it's generating English subtitles, but I can go into auto translate. And if I want them in Albanian, one click, it switches them over to Albanian. Again, if I want to go back in, I can change it to another language. And you can see the options here, right? Powerful tool. These good video players give you options like this, right? To, to make adjustments to the captions or to incorporate subtitles in other languages. And this is running on YouTube right now. YouTube does a really good job of giving you options around your caption needs. So these are three open captions, closed captions, and subtitles. So how do we get these captions? Where do, where do these captions come from? The videos I've shown so far have included ASR, which stands for Automated Speech Recognition, or Auto-Generated Captions. And these are common on most video platforms. When you upload a video, it will auto-generate the captions. But it's important that we distinguish between automated speech recognition captions and what are called CART services, which stands for Communication Access Real-Time Translation. Mouthful. And essentially, CART services are human-generated captions. And if you look at this chart here, you'll see that we have a comparison between ASR captions or automated captions and CART captions. If we look at accuracy, the accuracy for CART will be better. They do a better job. And that's because it's a human who can understand things like intonation and voice inflection and stutters and stammers and speech impediments much better than a computer can. There's something called WER or word error rate. And this is the number of speech recognition errors ASR makes. At this point, with the technology that we have, there will be a higher word error rate with automated captions than there'll be with human captions. Now, will this change? You know, we're seeing a lot of generative AI happening right now. It's powerful. It's probably going to get better over time. But for right now, Heart Services has accuracy down. In terms of speed, ASR will mostly outpace Heart Services. A computer can process language quite quickly. And so it can produce that caption or that transcript much faster. Understanding context or the connection between words and sentences and paragraphs, CART services will do a better job at this. In terms of cost, if cost is a variable, uh, CART services in many cases will have an hourly charge or a per session charge that could range from up to $100 to $200 an hour, depending on the service provider that you're working with. Whereas with computer-generated captions, there may be no cost 
or minimal cost, or it's part of a package or a solution that you already subscribe to. For example, Zoom has ASR captions enabled if you subscribe to their service. So I've said a lot there. I'm going to pause for a moment. I've talked about three different types of captions, open, closed, and subtitle. And I've talked about why you want to make considerations for ASR, automated captions, and cart service captions. Were there any questions up to this point before I move on to the next part? I'm going to try to scan through the chat if I can multitask here. What video player is that? I'm going to get to that question, Stephanie. Great question. Okay, good. If I'm missing anything, please let me know. Is there a preference for closed or open captions? Say we're making tutorial videos for students. Yeah, great question. Um, you want to think of where it's being hosted. So if your content is being developed and it's going to be put on a TV that's in a waiting room or an open area where people won't have the capacity to turn captions on or off, then you might want to consider using open captions where it's going to be baked into that video and anyone walking by or viewing it can read the caption. That would make sense. Whereas if it's on a platform, it's, if it's on a learning management system, or if it's on um, a website that you're using, then you want to give users that flexibility to turn it on or to turn it off. That's what I'd recommend, Holly. Now, I got a question for you, folks. I've just shown you four variables to consider between ASR captions and cart captions. Accuracy, speed, context, and cost. Are there others? Are there any other variables that you might want to consider as a content developer that you want to uh, use to decide whether to go ASR or cart service? If you know of any, throw them in the chat, please. Any other variables to consider? And if you don't have any, I got some, so not to worry. Format. Thank you, RJ. May not be accurate. Yeah, accuracy. What the end user is using for the device. Good. Very good. Yeah, you're you're getting at these. So whenever you're thinking of ASR or cart services, some other variables would be turnaround time. Right? How quickly do you need this? Do you need this live and instantaneous? And you can compromise on accuracy by having it live and instantaneous, then you might lean to. ASR, automated captions. Whereas if you need a 100% accurate transcript or caption for your users, then you might want to lean towards cart services. Another variable is speaker identification. If you're using a video that's got multiple voices, multiple speakers in the video, ASR is going to struggle with that. It's not going to do as good a job at identifying all those different speakers' voices and associated them to what was said correctly. Whereas cart services, of course, it's a human, and they can do a much better job at identifying the speaker. If you're displaying a video or you're showing a video that has sounds, sound effects, music files, um, any kind of non-speech components, a cart services will do a better job at identifying those. Computers struggle with identifying uh, non-speech sounds. And then another one I had is privacy. Depending on the discipline you're in, you may not have the flexibility to have a platform translate or transcribe your content because you don't want it to go to the cloud. You don't want it to be in that service provider who's going to be processing that text. You might want to lean towards cart services for that as well. Very good. Good. Okay, so let's move on to transcripts. So moving beyond captions, we want to look at these things called transcripts and their role in making digital content accessible. Transcripts serve as a textual representation of audio content. They contain every utterance of the speakers in an audio or a video file. 
And transcription, or sorry, transcripts can display time codes in relation to the video. So when this speaker said that, at what time? They provide a comprehensive, literal account of spoken words, auditory cues, background noise, music, everything can exist in a transcript. And this information is crucial uh, to help people understand what they're processing, especially for people who may be deaf, deafened, or hard of hearing to know what's happening in a video or in an audio file. Transcripts become an important tool. For example, in Zoom right now on your end, you should see that a transcript is running. I think this is running. I, I know we have cart services, so you may have to check on your end. But normally in a Zoom call, when you run a, a, a Zoom call, you'll see the caption button at the bottom. And there's a drop down arrow next to it. And you can turn the transcript on. And you can actually watch the live production of that transcript. You can even search through it. And you can even download a copy of it. So a really neat tool that's built into the Zoom platform. Some best practices you want to consider or some approaches you want to take when you're using transcripts is you want to ensure they are accurate and include the speaker's names. They include non-speech sounds such as applause or music or other sound effects. You want to format the transcript for easy reading and you want to break it up into sections so it's visually appearing that it's one section to the next. You might want to consider utilizing transcription tools like ASR to streamline the process. And then you want to manually edit it yourself or you want to provide it to a service provider or someone else that can clean it up and ensure that it's accurate. And you want to choose an option that balances accuracy, cost, and efficiency. Right? So there's some decisions you have to make around that. In an ideal world, money not being an object, then yes, we want 100% content that is accurate and um, efficiently provided to users. But I recognize that we are all from different institutions across this beautiful country, and we have different policies and procedures around things. And so you want to just consider how you balance that with your institution. A workflow might be you use ASR or automated captions initially. Then you can manually remediate it yourself, go back in, make some edits to the transcript, or again, you'd pass it on to a service provider to do that last 20%, right? The ASR can do, a, they, it can carry some of the load. They can do like almost 80% quite well. When you post any videos to your learning management systems or to websites, if the option exists to include a transcript, do so. It's helpful because it enhances the accessibility and offers users flexible ways of engaging with the content. So if that is an option, I would encourage you to incorporate it. I'm sorry, I'm gonna to apologize to you now. I promise this wasn't gonna get super techie, but it's it's gonna get a tiny, tiny, tiny bit techier right now. We're gonna talk about um, transcript files. So the idea here is in some cases you may want to take a transcript and use it to caption a video. And you will need to produce what's called a transcript file in order to do so. In other words, you'll produce a companion file to your video. So two files you'll really have. You'll have the video file and you'll have the transcript file. Now there are many different types of transcript files, but the most common ones are what I have on the screen here right now. One is called an SRT. I don't name these things, folks. I don't know, I, I don't get it. The one is called an SRT, a sub rip subtitle. And the other one is called a VTT, otherwise known as a web VTT. And this one is a web video text tracks file. We're going with SRT and VTT from now on. These are widely used with most video players on most social media platforms and in most professional editing software. Okay, so we have these two file types that contain the instructions, the rules for how the transcript is to run in that video. I'm gonna pause for a second to let that absorb any questions on this concept of transcript files, two different file types or multiple file types in some cases. 
Uh, you're welcome, Holly. Yeah, very true, Harper. Um, good. Okay, if there's any questions, please. Uh, I'm trying to pay attention to this chat. I'm not the best at it. I apologize. I'm trying to keep up. Uh, YouTube only accepts one. Very good. Yes, we're going to cover that. Good. Okay, if there's anything, please pop it in. And I'll try to. I'll try to keep up with y'all. Let's look at a transcript. I'm going to show you a transcript file in a video production tool. I'm going to show you a Word version of a transcript file and a VTT version of a transcript file. Okay, so let me hop out of my presentation here. Can I do it? Let's see. And I'm going to go here. Okay, so you can see here's my video. I think this is the video I was showing before on open education resources. And you can see on the side over here, the transcript section, we have a time. So at the zero second mark, the video player is told to display this text here. At the 20 second mark, it's told to display this text here. And so these are the rules of this transcript. It tells the video player when to display the text and in what order. So it's really neat that it sort of shows you this. You can see there's even an edit button here. So I can go in and I can edit it if it's incorrect. So this is that 80-20 piece I talked about earlier. The automated system will do 80%. And then you could come in and do this 20% to clean it up if there's any issues. In this particular tool, we have the option to download this transcript. So I can download it as a Word doc. Or I can download it as a VTT file. And I think I have both up here. So I'll go to my Word doc first. So you can see this is what it looks like. And so we talked about providing users with a clean transcript that's sectioned and ordered, this is helpful, right? Really clear breaking up of the sections for a user to sort of process their way through it. The VTT option, not as, not as pretty, <laughs> not as user-friendly here. You can see we have this hash code, and then we have these time markings, and then you have the text for each of the, uh, the time periods in the video. Okay, so these are examples of what a transcript would look like. And in this case, this is that VTT uh, transcript type. I'll pause for a second. If there's any questions there? Okay, good, good. So let's shift gears if there's nothing right now, and let's go to described video. So the next section or the next segment of the presentation, we're gonna talk about this concept of described video, also known as audio descriptions. And these support individuals who may be blind or have low vision. And described video provides a description of any on-screen actions, characters, scene changes, or any other elements that are not part of the dialogue. And the way audio description works is that they're inserted, these little audio files or these, these voiceovers are inserted at natural pauses in the dialogue. So it's never meant to overlay existing dialogue. It's meant to find that gap and insert what it can into that gap. And it includes any other sound elements. We talked about like music or background noise, anything like that can help, that can be used to paint the picture of that scene. And the goal of audio descriptions is to provide that seamless and inclusive experience without disrupting the original video that's being shown. Let me give you an example. We saw this video at the beginning, the uh, Frozen trailer, but I want you to now watch it for a second time. And what I want you to do is use the chat to capture the essence of what they did. Don't write exactly what the person is saying, but write what they did. How did they insert these audio descriptions? So let's let's watch this again and see if you can capture these and throw them into the chat. From the creators of Tangled and Wreck-It Ralph, Disney. A carrot-nosed co-lined snowman shuffles up to a purple flower peeping out of deep snow. Ooh. Hello. <laughs> he takes a deep sniff. His nose lands on a frozen pond. A 
reindeer looks up and pants like a dog. <gasps> Seeing the reindeer slip on the ice, the snowman smiles and moves towards him, though actually he's running on the spot. The reindeer falls on his chin. The snowman uses his arm as a crutch. The reindeer paddles his front legs. Head over heels, the snowman crawls along the ice. The reindeer does the breaststroke. The snowman rolls his body, but flips onto his back. The reindeer's tongue sticks to the ice. The snowman hurls his head. Twig arm and reindeer lips tug at the carrot. The carrot flies off and lands in soft snow. The reindeer goes after it with snowman and his body parts hanging on his tail. The snowman puts himself back together again and glumly contemplates his noseless state. The reindeer jams the carrot back in place and pants like a proud puppy. The snowman pats him with his stick thin arm, then goes to sneeze. He grabs his nose with both hands. His head shoots off. Frozen, coming this winter in 3D. Good. Okay, so some people put some comments. Very good. Um, Dan, mostly injected between important audio bands. Yeah, we, it found those gaps when there were sounds that were not super critical as part of the video and inserted that, that voiceover. It described the movement, the characters, the mood, the speech. Yes, all those pieces, you're right. And it did a really good job of, like if you even closed your eyes and listened to it, you could you could hear how much description was in that language. The use of adjectives. And like when it talked about doing the breaststroke on the ice, like you can visualize that much easier than just saying that the, the deer was struggling to move. Um, dynamic voice, very good. Reading any text on the screen, inserting descriptions around important non-speech sounds, yes. Describing facial expressions, yes, very good. Painted at the brown of uh, happy hour. Yeah. A few words. Yes, very good, very good. So it's this idea that we're really trying to present what is happening in the video as clearly as possible. And, and I said closing your eyes. If you can close your eyes and envision it or have someone else envision it, then that is on the right track of creating good described audio. Let's look at some best practices. If you're developing described video on your own, you want to focus on describing significant actions and expressions and settings that tell the story. You want to be brief, which is going to be a struggle, but you want to be brief yet descriptive. And we learned this technique. If you were in my session last week on writing good alt text, we talked about this concept of being brief yet descriptive or descriptive and concise. You want to use vivid language that paints the picture. That was very well done in that Disney piece there. And then, as mentioned, you want to insert these audio files or these voiceovers when they do not interfere with the main video. Now, let's try, what time is it? Ooh, we're getting close, okay. Let's try to put it all together. Let's try to put all these things together. And so I'm gonna show you two tools that you can use to put these pieces together. One is YouTube. So let me hop out of my presentation here and let me go to YouTube. So here I am in what's called YouTube Studio. So for any of our folks on the call today who use or post to YouTube, you'll, famili you'll be familiar with this. YouTube Studio is the place where you can upload videos, enter text around them, manage your subtitles, do all kinds of amazing things in this platform. But when you're logged into your video, so here's my video right here, along the side menu, you're going to see subtitles. So you click on subtitles. And when you click on the subtitles, you're going to see that you have a subtitle file. In this case, I have two, but this one's ineligible. So I'm focusing on this one here. And if you mouse over the middle section, you'll see a pencil will appear. That's the edit button. When I click on edit, it brings up this dialogue or this window. And here you can provide your own subtitles. So for this first one here, I can upload a file. And what's neat about YouTube is they let you upload a file that has timing embedded or not. The technology is so good now that if you have the timing, great. It'll pay attention to that timing. If you don't, it will try to sync up the video with what text you have in your document with what the video is playing. Pretty phenomenal. The second option is auto sync. And with this one, you can type in or paste in the text. And again, YouTube will sync it up. 
it'll try to figure out what words associate with what part of that video. Can't go back. Let me close it and come back in. And then the third one, we can manually type it. This one's not the most fun, folks. <laughs> this one, you have to type it in per um, time code. So you look at from the zero second to the fifth second, from the sixth second to the 18th second, etc. This is a little bit more technical and involved when you do it this way. When you're finished, you can save your draft or you can publish it to the platform. And now these captions will be embedded and part of that video. So YouTube does a pretty good job of allowing you to have flexibility around how you incorporate captions and transcripts with their content. I'll discard that. So that was YouTube. The second tool I wanna to show you, let me just bring that up on the screen so you can see what I'm talking about, is Microsoft Stream. So the Microsoft Stream tool is part of Microsoft Office or Microsoft 365. Most of us at our institutions have a Microsoft Stream, or sorry, a Microsoft license. Almost every post-secondary institution, to my knowledge, has a Microsoft license. And so this might be your preferred tool. You might want to check out both YouTube and Stream, but Stream is really powerful. And I'm going to show you why I like it. And it's the one that I use whenever I'm doing my content. So if I go to here, so this is Microsoft Stream. I was kind of showing it, you, showing it to you this whole time. And when you're in Stream, you want to look down the side for your video. You'll see there's the transcript. That's the tool I'm in right now. It shows me the transcript. But if I click on Video Settings, here's where you can do some really neat stuff. So once you've uploaded your video, one thing you can do is you can generate ASR or automated captions. So there'll be a button right here that says generate. I've done it already, but you would see a button that says generate right here. And it does it in a matter of minutes. You know, it depends on how long your video is. It could take five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. It just depends on how long the video is. And that is how you can begin to generate these ASR captions. And then we talked about editing them. So once the caption or transcript is available, you can come over here to the transcript section. You can now go in and you can edit it. So if I want to change this word, maybe it should be resource, not resources. I can just make that change. Okay, so really easy to adjust your transcript. Additionally, Microsoft Stream, from an accessibility point of view, has something called noise suppression. This is neat, because what this does is this allows for your video to focus more on voices to prioritize, that's the word I want to use, to prioritize voices over background sounds. And for a person like me who has a hearing-based disability, I struggle with voices all the time. And so if there's any tool that can increase my capacity to hear spoken word, that's a setting I like. And so you might you want to check out turning on noise suppression. Another tool that's built into Stream is right down here. You can upload your described audio file. So if you dictate your own into any tool that you can dictate uh, a voice recording into, you can then upload that into this video at certain points in the video. And that allows for you to incorporate described audio into this platform as well. Now, these are only some of the features of Microsoft Stream. There's so many more. So I would encourage you when you get a chance to check out Stream. It's a really powerful tool. To find it, you just log into your 365. You can see them in the browser version of Office. And then you click on your waffle right up here our menu, and then you'll see all your different Microsoft products. And this first one here for me shows stream. So you can check that out later and see if that's part of your package and you can use that tool. I'll pause for a second. If there's any questions about YouTube versus Microsoft stream. Uh, very cool. Very cool. Is there an audio file described video feature in YouTube at all? Not that I could find. I couldn't find that, Stephanie, um, which means that you may have to record it. Um, record two, you have to have two versions, the original video and then one that you've manually created yourself or you've inserted those described um, video components. Now, if someone else knows another way, I'm not a, I'm not a YouTube guru, 
So I'm, I'm, I usually, I usually use stream. So if anyone else knows there's a way to do described content with, with uh, YouTube, please put that into the chat. But I didn't find it on my searching. Okay. That's unlimited access to the PowerPoint. So we looked at YouTube, we looked at stream, other platforms. So there's a lot of platforms that we have working in education that provide captions and transcripts. And most of these tools are common across our institution. So Zoom being the first one here, Zoom incorporates ASR captions, automated captions, but you can also, as seen today, utilize cart services. So you can have human-based captioning as well. What's also neat about Zoom, which I like, it's a new feature, is that you can run the AI summary. So this has to be turned on at your institution and it may not be turned on by default, but the AI summary can provide a text summary of the entire Zoom call. And this can be so helpful for many of our learners who struggle with note-taking um, or processing of the information as they can get a, it's AI generated, but get an AI generated text summary of the entire Zoom call. So it's worth looking into that as well at your institution if you can turn that feature on, if you think it'll be beneficial as well. PowerPoint contains real-time ASR subtitles. So I could have turned these on. If you look at my screen, if I can get this to work, let's see. Right down here, I hope this is showing on your end. You can see my back forward button. And if I come right over here, I have turn subtitles on. And so if I toggle this switch on, I think it shrunk my screen a little bit for y'all. And it's now showing captions running in the PowerPoint. So this is a neat tool to have if you wanna have this running while you're teaching to support students who rely on captions. Aside from PowerPoint, Microsoft Word has a transcribe tool. This is amazing. So what you can do is you can record a voice or have an audio file. You can import it into Word and then Word will generate a transcript of that audio file right in the tool. So look for that under the dictate feature in Microsoft Word. And then Google Chrome, even Chrome, they did an amazing thing. They added a little tool to the Chrome browser that anytime a video plays or you're on a virtual call in Google Chrome, captions will display. So I use this all the time myself personally, really neat tool, just built in and it just works. It just turns on automatically when I'm in Google Chrome. Okay, I'm just gonna try to catch up to these questions. I'm sorry, folks. Um, can the noise suppressed file be downloaded from Microsoft? No, it cannot. It just does some magic on the back end to the audio of the file. You can't download it though. In stream, can it be one video and the audio file just be an option for users? Um, I might get you, Stephanie, to clarify that one for me in a bit. You just can choose this and describe video and not my captions. Yeah, I might get you to clarify that. We're almost at the end, so I'll, I'll let you mic on in two seconds. Um, how does Microsoft Teams compare to Zoom for captioning features? So I, I went hard um, during the pandemic on Teams versus Zoom, um, and Zoom was more accessible at that time. Teams has gotten better. They've incorporated cart services now and they've incorporated other features. And so it's getting better every day. I know there's team, there's, there's a Teams team and there's a Zoom team. Um, I'm still a uh, Zoom, to, Zoom team. I find it's a more accessible platform in general for my students with disabilities. Um, but as I mentioned, Teams is getting better and better each day. Um, good, okay. My last slide. Sorry, I'm running out of time here. Takeaways. So as we conclude this journey of unlocking captions and transcripts and audio descriptions, we want to remember that the core of this discussion isn't just about compliance. It's about people. It's about creating a digital environment that is welcome to everyone, regardless of their ability. And captions, transcripts, and audio descriptions are that bridge to understanding, engagement, and inclusivity. So continue to be advocates for accessibility and you can inspire change in the content that you create and that your teams create. So thank you very much, everyone, for your time. If there's any questions, feel free 
to let me know. Bethany, I'm reading your comment here about your institution making strides with captioning. Yeah, a lot of institutions are doing really good with captioning, but the described content is the challenge because as you can see, that requires a little, that's another layer of work that is not being done systematically. It's time consuming yet. Yeah, yeah, no, that's valid. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. Thank you for